Welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed experimenting with some of the ideas we learned about last time. You'll recall that, among other things, we learned about piano and forte dynamics and about tonic and dominant harmony. First, however, we learned about the C major five-finger pattern. This is the pattern of notes that begin with C as the lowest note in each hand. I hope that you practiced playing it both hands separately and hands together. I'm going to assume that you were able to play along with me on the video from our last lesson with both hands. You'll need to be able to play with me at my speed in order to progress during today's lesson. Since we are talking about the speed at which we play, we might as well learn the correct Italian term for speed. In music, we use the term tempo to describe how fast or slow we play. As the course progresses, we will learn specific Italian terms that describe various tempi. Tempi is just the plural of tempo. But even those terms we'll see are quite relative. So when we want to be very specific about the tempo of an exercise or a piece of music, we give a metronome marking. A metronome is a simple device that you can program to click at a particular tempo, measured in beats per minute, abbreviated as BPM. You may already have a metronome. If you own a digital piano, it will likely have a metronome built in. Various sizes of electronic metronomes are available from your favorite music retailer. These come at many price points, but you won't need anything expensive. You can also download an affordable metronome app for your smartphone, so you'll always have your metronome with you. Either way, in many of our assignments from here on, I'll give you a goal tempo that includes a metronome marking. So, if I say that we'll play our five-finger pattern at a quarter note equals 80, you can turn your metronome to 80 beats per minute, let it click about eight times so you really internalize the tempo, and then begin to play, playing one note with each click of the metronome. Let's try this with our C major five-finger pattern. Remember that the lowest note in each hand is C, so left hand finger five will be on C, and the right hand finger one, or thumb, will be on C. Now we'll listen for the metronome and play our pattern along with it. And ready, play. Let's try that one more time to make sure that you really have it. One, two, and play. Now that you have it, let's increase the tempo. We'll set the metronome to a quarter note equals 134, and we'll give it a try. Now, I'll count you in, and we'll play a little, a little faster than we just did. One, two, ready, play. Now, let's move our hands so that G is the lowest note in each hand. I'll give you a moment to find G. You may want to locate the group of three black keys, and then look for the second white key up. Or you could just remember that G was the last note, the top note that we played in the C, C major pattern, and move your hands accordingly. So now that you're in place, make sure that your hand position looks like mine. I'm going to set the metronome a little slower, and we'll try it together. Listen for the clicks to determine the tempo, and I'll help you come in. One, two, and play. G, A, B, C, D. Okay. Let's try that going up and down three times in a row to see if you really have it.
One, two, and play. Don't stop. Go back up. And one more time. So that's our G major five finger pattern. Next, I'd like us to take a closer look at the five-finger pattern that we just played. In the past, we've discussed seconds and thirds, or steps and skips. As you know, the major five-finger pattern moves by seconds, or in a stepwise motion. However, you may have noticed that some of those steps are bigger than others. In a moment, we are going to transpose this pattern into a different key. Transpose is just a musician's way of saying that we're going to take a melody and transfer it into another key. It will be recognizable as the same melody, it just begins on a different note or pitch. When I tell my college music majors that we're going to transpose something at the piano, initially they panic and probably wish they could flee from my classroom. But if you know what you are doing, it doesn't have to be too complicated. In fact, you have already transposed. It's what we just did when we took the C major five finger pattern and then played it in G. However, there are 10 other major five finger patterns and the others look different on the keyboard. That's why we need to explore the two different kinds of seconds that we encounter in this pattern. You'll recall that when we first introduced the concept of a second, we said that it was one note name or pitch name to the very next pitch. For example, G to A to B to C are all seconds. Or we used adjacent fingers, or we didn't skip any white keys on the piano. Here's where I have to modify that definition a little. If we look at B to C, Indeed, we don't skip any keys on the piano. But let's look more closely at A to B. We actually skipped the black key in between the A and the B. Had you noticed that? If you had, you are very astute. If not, don't worry. I didn't stress this earlier because I didn't want to complicate things. But now I know that you are ready to notice these little differences. So A to B and B to C are both seconds, but B to C is called a half step or a minor second because there are no keys in between. And A to B is called a whole step or a major second because there is one key in between. Another way to think about this is that a whole step is made up of two half steps. Armed with this new information, let's try to identify the whole step and half step pattern for our G major five finger pattern. Place your hands over the G major pattern. Begin on G. Now from G to A is a whole step because there is a black key in between. A to B is another whole step and B to C, we noted, is a half step. And C to D is a whole step. So the whole step and half step pattern is whole, whole, half, whole. The shorthand that musicians use for this is W, W, half, W. This is the pattern for the first five notes of every major scale. Memorize that pattern, whole, whole, half, whole because you'll need it for your warm-ups in the coming weeks. So let's figure out the D major five finger pattern. First, we must place our lowest finger on D, then apply the whole and half step pattern above that note. So we begin with D. What is a whole step above D? Do you have E? If not, just remember that there will be one key between the two notes of a whole step. Now try to find a whole step above E, and I'll give you a moment. 
For this one, the key that we skip is a white key, which means that we'll be playing this black key. So what shall we name that note? Because we cannot skip letter names when moving by step, and we just played E, it has to be some kind of F. When we play a half step above any given note, we call it a sharp. The symbol for a sharp looks like this. And no, I'm not tweeting hashtags at you. This is the musical symbol for a sharp. Okay, so now where were we in our pattern? We began on D. We did a whole step and a whole step. So now we are at the half step. A half step higher than F sharp is G, the very next key higher. And finally, we need one more whole step above G. So we arrive at A. So the pattern looks like this on the piano. And if we say the pitch or note names, we have D, E, F sharp, G, A. I like this pattern because of the symmetry. Two white keys, a black key, and two white keys. For most people, this pattern fits comfortably under the hand, too. So let's try it at a fairly slow tempo, and we'll plan on playing it three times in a row without stopping in between, because it may take you a few tries to play it well. You can try just one hand or both hands right now, whichever you'd prefer. One, two, here we go. D, E, F sharp, G, A. G, F sharp, E, and again. again. How did you do? Before our next lesson, be sure to get comfortable with this five-finger pattern and your other new pattern in G major. I'll give a goal tempo for these at the end of this lesson. In the meantime, let's review our C major five-finger pattern one more time. How about if we try it at a forte dynamic? As you begin, remember to keep your arms and wrists relaxed and use your arm weight to create a rich, full tone. And here we go. One, two, three, and play. With your left hand, play the tonic note with me. And now the dominant note. Great, so now we're ready to play our Ode to Joy with the melody in the right hand and the tonic and dominant notes in the left hand. Get your hands in place, and here we go. One, two, and play. Play that once more, but this time try to play your right hand forte and your left hand piano. One, two, and play. likely have to continue working on the balance between the melody and the harmony. Most people find it very difficult to play one hand louder than the other initially. Keep reviewing Ode to Joy, and hopefully you will find that you are able to achieve the balance between the melody and the harmony better with each passing day. Let's give your left hand a break for a few minutes and review melodic tune. If your right hand feels tight or stiff, take a moment and give it a quick shake and place it down by your leg. I want you to be aware of any tension, and when you feel stiffness or tension, take a quick break. 
If you are like most of my students, you are trying and concentrating really hard, and it's easy to neglect physical sensations of tension until those turn to pain. We want to prevent pain and tension by taking short but regular breaks, and I'll talk more about this as our lessons unfold. Okay, now we're ready to try melodic tune. We'll play the entire piece together. Remember, if you make a mistake or get lost, try to jump back in and get to the end with me. Get your right hand in place. One, two, play. I'd like to review the B section, or the second half, one more time, since that's the section where most people run into trouble. Measures 9 through 12 usually aren't too bad, because you've already played these. However, at measure 13, the right hand begins a slightly more complicated pattern. In quarter notes, you play a combination of seconds and thirds that trip many people up at first. You'll play a G with the fifth finger on the downbeat of measure 13, then step down to F with finger 4, then skip down to D with finger 2. You repeat that pattern in measure 14, but continue stepping down to C on the downbeat of measure 15. You repeat that C in the final measure. So let's try the second half again, starting at measure 9. Here we go. Okay, now that we've reviewed the B section, let's try the entire piece again from the beginning. One, two, three, ready, play. So the next step is to add some harmony to our melodic tune. You'll see that now the left hand has either tonic notes, as in measure 1, or dominant notes, as in measure 5. I'm going to play both hands together three times with just a slight break in between each. You may listen the first time or try to play the left hand with me. The second time, I want you to try to play the left hand with me. And the final time, you may review the left hand again or try to add the right hand. So, here we go. Here's the first time. I'm playing both hands. You may watch the left or try the left. One, two, play. Now, this time, play your left hand with me. I'll play the melody as well so that you can hear how it fits together. One, two, play. time, I'm going to slow it down for those of you who want to try it hands together. One, two, play. One, two, three. Okay, so rarely can anyone who is a true beginner at our first lesson play this perfectly with me at this point. 
However, practicing this piece hands together on your own for our next lesson will be a critical part of your practice assignment. The most efficient way to learn it will be to break it into two smaller A and B sections and practice each of these until you can play comfortably. Then try playing from beginning to the end. Finally today, I want to begin to look at some on-staff notation. As you probably know, we notate music, the notes and pitches, on something called a staff. A staff has five lines and four spaces, and we number each of these from bottom to top, and this has to do with how we read multiple notes at once, and it is important for reading piano notation. In music, treble refers to higher notes or sounds, and bass refers to lower notes or sounds. So we notate the higher notes, which for now will be played with the right hand, on the treble staff, and indicate this at the beginning of each staff with a treble clef. We notate the lower notes, that will be played with the left hand for now, on a bass staff, and put a bass clef at the beginning of each staff. Because we have to use both hands to play the piano, bar lines go from the bottom line of the bass staff to the top of the treble staff. And at the beginning of each set of staves, the two staves are joined by a brace. So the bass staff and clef are on the bottom, just like your left hand is on the bottom or lower part of the keyboard, and the treble clef and staff are on the top, just as your right hand is on the top or higher part of the piano keyboard. Just as with the off-staff examples we looked at, we will still read the notation from left to right. But we are also aware of the vertical aspect of the notation in instances where the hands must play together. This is a comparison of the off-staff and on-staff notation for the first two measures of Ode to Joy. On the staff, we place the notes either on a line or in a space. The beauty of the staff is that every note on the staff corresponds with a specific note on the piano keyboard. Where the note head is placed allows us to identify and name the pitch. We say that a note is a line note, or on a line, when it looks like this. Some people like to think of it as the line going through the middle of the note head. Space notes are placed perfectly between the lines. When we move from a line note to a space note, we are moving by step, or by a second. Likewise, moving from a space note to a line note in either direction is the interval of a second. When we move from a line note to a line note, or from a space note to a space note, these are thirds, or skips. One of the trickiest things when first translating written notation to the piano is to get our hands in the right location on the keyboard. So to help with that, we use landmark notes. These are notes that we will learn really well and from those notes, we should be able to figure out others. We'll learn four landmark notes today and expand upon these next time. The first two landmark notes that we'll learn are in the treble clef. These are G and treble C. This note on the second line of the treble clef staff is the G above middle C. I would recommend using this as the starting G for your five-finger pattern this week. And the treble C in the third space is one octave above middle C. In the bass clef, our landmark notes will be F and bass C. The F is on the fourth line, and it is the F below middle C, just to the left of the group of three black keys. And the bass C in the second space is the C one octave below middle C. Another way that many of us remember the right hand G and the left hand F landmark notes has to do with the older way of naming the clefs. The bass clef used to be, and is still sometimes called, the F clef. 
It is because of the way it originates on the F line before curving up to the top and then down toward the bottom of the staff. And the two dots that follow it are in the spaces on either side of the F line. It even looks a little like an F. Likewise, the treble clef is also known as the G clef. If you squint your eyes and imagine a cursive capital G, you can imagine that this looks a little like a G. But the important thing that you will notice is that the clef emanates from the G line, then circles around it up to the middle line and down to the bottom line, and after sweeping up above to the top of the staff, it falls down in a straight line through the G again. So if you forget which landmark note is which, looking at the clefs and remembering their alternate names will help you. So if we go back to our new G major five finger pattern, let's see how it will look on the staff. In the treble clef, you'll see that it begins on our landmark note then moves up by step to A in the space, B on the middle line, up another step to C, and finally to the line note D. Then it moves down by step. In the bass clef, we know our landmark F note in the fourth line. The first note in this pattern is a second or step above F, so it must be G, and it will be located right next to and above the landmark F on the piano keys. Here again, the notes move from spaces to lines by step up and down. When we read by referencing the specific landmark notes and then using the intervals to figure out the subsequent notes, this is known as reading intervallically. Intervallic reading is an important part of good sight reading. In your music book, you'll find a notated version of the melodic tune. I encourage you to explore it by reading landmark notes and using intervals during your practice week this week. Since you already know how it sounds and where your hands go, you'll just be using the notation as a guide. But essentially, this is what musicians do. And I hope that you start recognizing some of the notes as you work through it during the next few days. So before our next lesson, please practice the following. First, get a metronome or download a metronome app. Then work on the C, the G, and D major five finger patterns. Your goal tempo should be a quarter note equals 132. Memorize your landmark notes and start trying to identify other pitches around these notes. Work on the melodic tune with both hands and try reading the notation. Your goal tempo for this should be a quarter note equals 80. And work on the Ode to Joy. I've also included an on-staff version of this piece in your music book, so please use the Lesson 4 version this week for extra practice reading the pitches on the staff. Be sure to shake out your arms and take short breaks during your practice as well. Remember, spend as much time as you need on any portion of the materials that you find tricky. Relax your hands and arms often, and pause or review lesson materials and play along with me when you feel confident in your abilities. Until next time, happy practicing!